Okay, it's recording now. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming here. Uh, this is work I'm currently doing and I'm just finishing a book that'll be published maybe this year or next by Cambridge University Press on cooperative action. Uh, and I think the, the clearest way to demonstrate what it is is to um, show you. So the first thing is that human beings build action by combining different kinds of parts. So here we have an utterance or a sentence and it's made from different parts. Let's just loosely call them words for a moment. Why don't you get out my yard? You build the sentence by combining different kinds of parts. Then somebody constructs new action by performing operations on the materials that have been put in a public environment by someone else, like the prior utterance. So Tony says, why don't you get out my yard? Chopper says, why don't you make me get out the yard? And what he's doing is that he's reusing many of the parts that were provided by the first utterance, uh, by Tony's utterance, but at the same time he's transforming them into something new. He's not repeating Tony's action, he's making a new counteraction to what Tony said. And part of that process of transforming them into something new is you add new parts. And basically, I might have a slide, uh, is that you build new action by performing accumulative transformations on a public substrate created through the work of predecessors. And by accumulative pr transformations, I mean that you reuse material, so they accumulate. You're reusing, why don't you, or something. But at the same time, you're transforming them as you do it. And I may say this later in a slide, but basically, I see the process of building action as a process of decomposition and reuse, in which you're paying very close attention to the actual materials in uh, another action or other kind of thing that you'll use as a form of, um, uh, uh, as a point of departure for your current action. So thus, we're working within a framework of resources used by the prior actor. And in this sense, we inhabit each other's actions. So even though Chopper is opposing Tony, he's actually inhabiting the world of structure and resources that was created by Tony. But as you inhabit each other's actions, at the same time, you build a, uni a position that's uniquely your own. Indeed, in this case, directly opposed to the action used by uh, uh, the action used as a point of departure. So the fact that you're reusing materials doesn't mean you're amorphously always doing the same thing, but you're actually able to transform them to build something new and different. Now, this substrate is not blank, but a trove of resources. This is from Candy's earliest fieldwork, brilliant fieldwork, of uh, African-American kids in Philadelphia. She published and he said, she said. And here are some of the kids are confronting each other. Billy says, ha ha. Martha says, I don't know what you laughing at. Billy says, I know what I'm laughing at, your head. Martha, I know I'm laughing at your head too. I know you ain't laughing, because you ain't laughing. Uh, many things about this. I find this extraordinarily rich. But if you look at, for example, line four, um, um, uh, I know I'm laughing at your head too. It's syntactically quite, uh, quite intricate. And I think the traditional way in formal linguistics would be to look at that as emerging from the mind and language resources of an isolated speaker. But here we can see how it's been incrementally constructed through these transformative operations on materials provided by earlier talk. Uh, uh, okay, here's another one. You sound terrible. We sound just like you look. What's the matter? What's the matter with you? Same thing that's the matter with you. Well, nothing's the matter with me. Well, nothing's the matter with me then. Well, then go somewhere. Well, I want to stay here. Uh, and I, I really find this incredibly poetic. And the thing is that most teachers and everything try to this way, it's terrible for kids to be arguing in the playground. And they think they learn grammar in school. But you have a much more intricate analysis of grammar, including didactics like somewhere, here, etc., than you ever would in a classroom exercise. Um, okay, so accumulatively, each next action creates a transformed substrate that constitutes the point of departure for the following action. Okay, in this sense, what's happening is similar to recursion because the output of each step is the input for the next step. Uh, however, it's not the kind of center embedding uh, recursion that's talked about in linguistics. Uh, and uh, it is also 
uh, unlike, say, a purely mathematical process, it's capable of additions and, um, you know, and unanticipated modifications. So it's not exactly like, say, a Fibonacci sequence in that sense. Okay, now, um, here I'm going to look very quickly at a noun phrase, because we could see this in whole utterances, but here's a single noun phrase being built incrementally through the actions of multiple actors. And what's happened at this point was that uh, Martha, and, Martha and her daughter Susie, in fact her whole family, went to this wedding. But one daughter, Kathy, couldn't go to the wedding. She was off at some group. Uh, okay, so Kathy asks about the, the wedding. Was her dress right on? And her mother, Martha, says, her dress was white? And then hesitates. Now, as soon as she hesitates, Susie comes in and says, Islet. So she's uh, reading the hesitation or co-participating as a, a word search and thinking that her, whatever, acting as though her mother is unable to produce the next word in the utterance and she's producing that next word. Well, the thing that you see about this is that you're displaying really fine-grained understanding of what another's about to say by producing the next element in their noun phrase. I was saying a moment earlier, we inhabit each other's action. Now, as you do this, you are also using grammar as a form of local endogenous social organization. So the gr unfolding grammatical structure within the utterance displays a constrained but open at set and it's set of possibilities for what can occur next. So when you have this emerging noun phrase, you know, her, 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 her dress was white, you figure after that adjective you'll get a noun or another adjective. You're figuring you're not getting weird things like, I don't know, you know, uh, a preposition or something like that. So there is projections as to what can occur next, but you don't have it exactly. So you're living in this world of constrained but open-ended projections. And what grammar is doing at this point is giving you this emerging framework of intelligibility that you use not only to understand what has been said, but to make projections about what might be said next. Now, this is also very relevant to time. William James, very famous statement, and I didn't have a place to put it all, but he referred to time as being kind of like a saddle in the sense that you look at two directions at once. You look at the past, you're organizing your, your current action with reference to the past while looking toward an, un, uh, an anticipated future. And here we can see that. The emerging grammatical structure of the utterance has created a relevant past that you're using to try to project and bring into actuality, actually, a relevant next future. I will point out, and I think one thing that's perhaps important, William James looked at this totally within the domain of human psychology, of, the, of time. Not philosophic psychology, but of time. The thing that we get here is we can see this domain is being structured by the emerging organization of language. And in this sense, it's putting an historical sedimentation on these processes of projection. If you don't know English, you couldn't participate in this. Some of you were saying you speak Mandarin. If you were about to do something like this in Mandarin, I would not be able to participate in this. So there's an historical dimension to these processes of communication. And also these processes are lodged within communities. The communities being constituted through the participants who can use the semiotic resources in process. However, and a further development. So first James, then I want to get an historical dimension of language, and finally Alfred Schutz, influenced by people like Husserl and also Heidegger. He talked about a we relationship, and he said that the we relationship was constituted through intersecting consciousnesses inhabiting, inhabiting unfolding time together. This is quite relevant to both ethnomethodology and things like Irving Goffman's notion of mutual monitoring. We're always living in a world in which we are attending to the consciousness, experience, and actions of another. We inhabit our, our individual consciousnesses intersect within this stream of unfolding action. He also noted that it's impossible for one person to know with precision the subjective experience of another. So he's saying our consciousnesses, our experience intersect, but you haven't got like a Vulcan mind melt. You don't get into each other's mind, but the differences are always there. And again, clearly what I'm trying to argue is that 
the fact that we're unfolding time, like in this noun phrase, is a real demonstration of the intersection, but at the same time, the people are different, and we get that a moment later when the original sme speaker, Martha, doesn't just accept eyelet. What she does is, as she comes in and she says, embroidered eyelet. Now, it could well be that the word she was searching for was not just eyelet, but embroidered eyelet. So you've had uh, Susie coming in, making a projection, uh, being there. She had a great deal, if you want, common ground. But at the same time, that's located as different and challenged again. So you have this world of shared meaning, but a world of shared meaning that is maintaining the differences between the actors engaged in this process. And what makes it possible is how you're coming together within these frameworks of um, cooperative action. Okay, so what you're getting here then is that you have a single noun phrase. Her dress, well, let's just say embroidered eyelet. But that noun phrase is being built incrementally and cooperatively through the different contributions of different actors. And here's another example that I won't go into. It's a couple, they're talking about their marriages. The husband keeps coming in. The wife is saying, when we were youngsters, we eloped. We were married in Maryland. Husband goes, well, to Elton. Nadine went to Elton, Maryland. And went to Elton is kind of like saying at that point that you went to Las Vegas. And the wife is trying to put a different spin uh, on their marriages, uh, you know, at this point. So once again, you get that. And this is quite common to have this cooperative construction in the midst of, well, I mean, it's okay, look. People talk about social organization and all these big things like, you know, exchanges and potlatches, but it's really intimate. You have social organization in the midst of individual noun phrases, and it's this kind of cooperative action all the way through among human beings. Now, why am I phrasing this as accumulation? I um, mean, there'd be other ways to talk about it. Well, it turns out that when, if you look at biological anthropologists, they argue that one of the distinguishing characteristics of the human species is that we accumulate things. Um, the classic example used by Rob Boyd is if we wanted to live up in the Arctic, you put any of us, I'm, I'm saying, I'm wouldn't say anybody up here in the Arctic and you drop us in the middle of the ice flows, we're dead in a day. Uh, but you did have people, native peoples of the Arctic, who were able to survive and thrive there. But they did it by accumulatively reusing all the solutions to living in that environment that had been found by their ancestors. Like how do you build shelter? Somebody discovered how to build igloos. They discovered how to fish, how to hunt. So every society is building on the work of our predecessors. I'm giving this talk now because someone figured out how to build a computer, a projector, all this stuff. Okay, so what I'm trying to say though is that accumulation doesn't go only on the order of whole societies but that it's a gene general, generic, and I think a definitive attribute of how human beings build action. This is the way that you build action, and it occurs as much in individual noun phrases as it does in the constitution of whole societies. Now, there's a second thing that is argued to be unique about human beings, and that is cooperation. And it's long been argued, and it's well demonstrated, that no other animal cooperates in the way that human beings do. So these are two, there's other things as well, and we, we, I'll look at some of them more, like tools. But accumulation and cooperation are two of the defining characteristics of the human species. And what I'm trying to do is re-specify cooperation, or take a slightly different take on it as cooperations. And at the end, I'll try to talk about how my notion of cooperation, uh, of cooperations differs from cooperation. And I'm trying to say that that is going on all the time and that it is not one way you could quickly see some of the differences is what we just saw. Cooperation is not only helping other people, but even when you're in the midst of countering and challenging other people, you're still in a form of cooperative action. So I am agreeing with the biological anthropologists that accumulation and cooperation are absolutely central to the human adaptation, but I want to locate them in the basic organization of human action and argue that they're going on everywhere. We'll see they're going on in tools, they're going on in language. That's the kind of creature that we are. And by and large, other animals, with some exceptions, but let's just say in general, other animals don't build their worlds in this way or their action in this way. Okay, let's look at this as well in terms of human tools. 
This is a very simple tool, a stone axe. Candy and I saw it in a, in a museum up in uh, the mountains of Chile. And it's a stone axe. And you can see that, that, like we did with the utterance, it's made of different parts. You have a stone, you have a wooden handle, and you have uh, leather thongs. Now, uh, I'll just go back. The deal is, you couldn't disassemble that axe and still have the axe. If you just had a stone or if you just had the leather thongs, you wouldn't have the axe. So the axe is constituted as this pattern that's bringing together different kinds of resources, much the way the utterance is constituted as the pattern that's bringing together these different resources. Now I talked here about how you could um, accumulatively reuse with transformation the elements, the, the pattern elements, if you want the organization, the syntax, etc., of the prior utterance. Well, you can do the same thing with tools. One of the things that you could do, for example, very simply here, is you could replace the axe head, the big stone, with a point, with an arrowhead. Then you'd have an arrow. You could replace it with a thing like this for digging, and you'd have an adze. So once you have this building tools through pattern organization, you have the potential, not only the potential, it's actualized very quickly for a cumulative reuse with transformation. I'll look a little later. Um, I, I would at least like to entertain the possibility that a lot of this, including, well, the development of language, emerged in the Middle Stone Age in Africa. Because what you find during the Middle Stone Age in Africa is this incredible proliferation of tools built from different parts. And in fact, these are, say, the kind of parts that you would get in a tool. But the most successful tool in human history, makes the iPad phone look like nothing, was the Acheulean hand axe. This tool existed for over a million years on at least three continents. It was the most signature tool of throughout most of human history. But it rarely changed. It might have gotten refined, but it didn't change into other tools. And my own take, on, at least from a perspective of this talk, is why it didn't change, is it isn't built from parts. It doesn't have this process for transformative decomposition and reuse that you get once you start building a tool by combining separate parts to construct the tool. Um, okay, now uh, what I would now like to look at, uh, and we'll look at this a little bit, um, is um, some of the ways that this is very powerful in language and social organization. And I'm going to look at a man with a three-word vocabulary. You'll see Candy and I, younger versions of us, in the talk. Um, but uh, he, uh, this was my father. Uh, and he had a very severe stroke. And the stroke left him able to speak only three words. Yes, no, and and. And despite that, he was a very, very powerful speaker in conversation. And uh, I think if you were to look at either linguistics or anything, you'd figure somebody only able to produce a single word is not going to be a great speaker. So how was that possible? Well, first of all, he did have some other semiotic resources. He had very rich prosody. He had gesture. And in particular, he had the ability to understand what other people were doing. So since I have more time than I do sometimes, I'll just give you a simple example. At this point, somebody's given his daughter, my sister Pat, over there on the left, this calendar for Christmas. And wow, look at that one. <laughs> so all he's saying, da, 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 da. he's not producing any language structure, but he's producing rich prosody. And I think that you can hear in his prosody through his uh, an, a stance. He's admiring what he's looking at, and he's showing the referent of what he's looking at by having the calendar toward him. You know that he is commenting on the calendar. So even without any words, he's able to build a rich action. And now we'll look at this in a, a, a very simple but I think very interesting example. Now what's happened here is that Candy and Chill and I are sitting in his kitchen. He lived in New Jersey. Uh, and we're talking about how much snow they've had. And I, I think, um, um, I don't know, some of you... I don't, does anybody have trouble understanding what's being played when the tape is being played? Uh, I, okay, so I'm, I'm going to play this now, and I hope you can understand it, and the transcript's right you there. Have that much this year, right? <coughs> no, no, I think 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then there was some that's oh, still some. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was yeah. Some, but last year, whoop. No, no, no. The year before that. Yeah. Was everybody able to understand that clearly? Why don't I play it just one more time? You haven't had that much this year. Right? No, no, not this no, year. No. Then there was some that's oh, still some. Yeah, 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 yeah. But last year, whoop. Yeah. No, no, no. The year before that. Yeah. Okay, the question I want to focus on is who's speaking in line 14 or the year before last? And going back on distinctions made by Irving Goffman when he deconstructed the speaker, we could certainly say that it's Candy's voice that's being heard. And moreover, Candy's the one that produces this syntactically complex utterance. But to some extent, is she the author? Is she the person res taking responsibility for that utterance. Because if you look at line 12, just about two seconds earlier or less, she said something different. She said last year. And why now is she saying the year before last? And it's because Chill has cut in and with his no, 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 he's objected to what she is saying. And she's now trying, and also clearly he's the big expert, he's the one that lives in the area. And by looking at the objection, Candy doesn't have to figure what does no, no, no mean in isolation, but she can inspect her own talk, see what might have been wrong with it, and provide an alternative version that he can either accept or reject. And we'll look at that um, a little bit more. Okay, so what does his no do? He isn't saying no, 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 just in isolation. He's saying no, not last year. In the same we saw with the kids, his operations, his no, is performing operations on what Candy said, and it's accumulatively incorporating into his talk the rich structure that was created by Candy. So with only a single word, said three times, he's able to make a complicated statement. No, not last year. But this only emerges through the way in which both talk and action are being built through cooperative um, uh, uh, transformations. So Chill's impoverished lexicon is filled up with Candy's rich semantics. Okay, and a way to look at this then is if we take Peirce's notion of the sign, where he said a sign something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. Well, first of all, no, 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 indexically incorporates, by, and by indexically I mean it's operating on the closest thing. It's like pointing toward it. That's the thing you know. It indexically incorporates what someone else just said. But at the same time, the no, no, no is a symbol. It's recognized through convention rather than through uh, inherent resemblance. And as a symbol, he's doing something. He's objecting. He's transforming what Candy said. He's not saying it's right. He's completely disagreeing with what she just said. So in this sense, the speaker is distributed across multiple utterances. And you know, there's a, a prejudice, I think, in formal linguistics and even in conversation analysis for what you might call a punctual vision of the speaker. That you think that the speaker exists in a single body and the utterance exists at a single moment in time. But the resources for what's being said here are distributed across Chill's No and Candy's, uh, the talk that it's operating on, and also multiple bodies. And let's just take a look at the video of this now. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll look at this rather quickly, but... You haven't had that much this year, have you? No, no not this no, year. No. Then there was some, there's oh. still some. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was yeah. some, but last year, whoop. Yeah. No, year, no, no. The year before that. Yeah. Okay, I'll play you it again. I want to just go over the end of it real quick. No, no not this no, year. No. Then there was some, there's oh. still some. Yeah, 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 there yeah. Was yeah. Some, but last year, whoop. Yeah. No, year, no, no, no. I, I will just go quickly. He actually gets Candy's gaze again. She's turned and looked toward Chuck, and he gets her gaze again. Notice also how his body goes into this alert thing. One of the things I think that you could see in his body is he's not acting as a recipient or hearer for something that Candy's telling, but he's acting as kind of a co-speaker. In other words, he's checking if the words that Candy produces are in fact the words that should be spoken at this time. You'll also see this gesture that exactly tracks his utterance. The year before last. Yeah. As it goes, the year before last. And it's argued by a lot of people that gestures are basically speakers' activities rather than hearers. Well, in a way, you have the whole gesturing process, again, distributed across multiple actors and multiple bodies. 
Candy provides the language, while Chill provides the gesture that is tied to that language. Then he drops his body. Even at that, that I, I didn't. Uh, I want to stop that. Okay, I'll, I'll let play. Well, let me get. Let me turn that off for a sec. It's off. Okay. Okay. So what does this mean? In most thinking in every field, from linguistics to sociology to moral philosophy, etc., you begin by positing an actor such as the ideal speaker hearer who's fully endowed with all the abilities required to perform the cognitive, linguistic, social, or moral processes being theorized. So if you're going to enter into a social contract, even with a very liberal philosopher such as John Rawls, you're going to have to be a full-fledged individual capable of entering, of entering that co contract. So in this sense, anybody who arises on the scene, like Chill, with impoverished abilities, or a young child, or a person suffering from Down syndrome or something. They're outside the sphere of how social scientists theorize the competence of human actors. And I think that's a really major problem. Now, what I uh, think of here, one way of thinking about this is, metaphor if you want, how would you get, suppose you have a very, very quickly flowing river, and you want to get from one side to the other. How would you do it? Well, the way we do it in America, etc., is we'd make a boat, and inside the boat we'd put a big powerful motor, and we'd burn a lot of fossil fuel to get across the river. In fact, this is in Basel, Switzerland, and it's a ferry boat. The way the ferry boat works is it doesn't have a motor. There is a cable that's stretched across the river. The current is coming in this direction. It's a quite powerful current, and the boat is attached to that cable with another cable. So all that has to happen is that the driver of the boat, the captain, whatever he is, he uses his rudder to turn the boat so that it's sidewards to the current. And as the current comes down, it pushes the boat forward across the river. So in this sense, you're using the river itself as your power source in order to get across it. And this is the way I kind of see what Chill does. Instead of acting as an isolated, self-contained actor, he participates in the unfolding flow of language and interaction and intervenes in that flow in order to build the action that he wants at that point. So instead of starting from this picture of an ideal actor and going into everybody's mental life, and look, this is in spades, Searle, everything under the sun. That's the way Chomsky is the way just basically everybody thinks. I would think that the place we want to look for things is in a multi-party interactive field that's constituted through the actions of multiple actors with diverse abilities. Now in this case, Chill can make meaning by drawing upon the resources and abilities of other actors. We could look at young children. We could look at the ability to make meaning in situations where you don't fully know a language, etc. And I, my own sense is that by a focus on the fully competent, isolated, self-contained entity, including psychology, we've ended up with a very distorted picture of human beings. I think that human beings are intrinsically social creatures, and not just because they get along with each other or something, but social because our ways of building action are in fact ones that are built through uh, relying upon abilities and contributions of others in that sense. Now, I want to go very quickly over how this is cooperation. So, Chill performs actions. He's, everybody builds action by performing operations on materials constructed by somebody else. So he does his no, no, no on something that Candy did. And that something else, I'm just, just for a term, I'm going to call it public substrate. Okay, and then when he says no, 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 he creates a new substrate. And Candy can operate on his no, no, no to change, to produce a relevant next action that involves a transformation of what she said first. And in fact, that goes on and on and on. So there's accumulation as well. Chill's nose incorporate language structure created by somebody else. The structure accumulates. And Candy, in the year before last, she accumulatively incorporates with transformation everything that's gone before. She's operating on Chill's no, but at the same time, she's reusing the first thing that she said the last year, but transforming it into something di different. So Candy and Chill intricately participate in each other's actions. Again, we inhabit each other's actions. 
while defining ourselves as distinct, differentiated actors with unique positions. Again, the speaker is distributed across multiple utterances and bodies. You're getting other forms of, semi forms of semiosis other than language, like gesture, implicated in this process. And what you're doing is you're integrating into a common action diverse elements from diverse semiotic fields, language structure in the body, and from diverse actors. Okay, now, what I've done so far is focus largely on language structure. But in fact, equally crucial, and, and language structure, like let's just take the, the first one, if you've got a sentence, why don't you get out my yard? You're picking everything from the same domain. You've got different words, and that's the kind of parts that you're using. But what you can do as a human being is build action by bringing together very different kinds of materials, very different parts. And I want to start with something that's super simple, which is prosody. In other words, the way that you speak the words. And again, I'm going to look at a sequence in which Chill uses exactly the same words again and again. No, no. But each of these words, each use of those words constructs a different kind of action, both because of what it's replying to, but also through his prosody, and let me just go, uh, I'll, I'll play this sequence now. What's happened is that we're sitting in his, uh, in his living room, and he used to spend part of the year in Florida, and he just got, oh my gosh, what does this do? Okay, he just got some really good grapefruit from Florida. Do you want me to take that away? No, no. Oh, you like it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so take some back with us. No, no. No, no. No, it's illegal. Yeah. No, no. So let me play that again. Do you want me to take that away? No, no. First, no, no. Oh, you like it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so take some back with us. No, no. Different no, no. And now yet a different no, no. No, no. No, it's illegal. Yeah. No. So he's used exactly the same words, but each of these has been a different action. And I want to look at that in a little bit more detail. And in fact, the, the thing is that um, Chuck can't figure out what he wants, and we'll look at this in more detail. He can't figure out what Chill wants him to do. And so the initial ones, when he says, do you want me to take that away, or what takes him back with us, you just get, no, no, no. He can't understand it. But he can understand the deeper prosody. He can understand that now he's not trying to locate something. He's operating on what Chuck just said. I mean, there's this judging tone, no, no, or something. So, so it's really the actions are shifting quite dramatically. And if we look at his um, utterances, the thing I would like to indicate is that each of his no's is spoken very differently. It has different prosody. Let's take a look. No, 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 no. So can you see how by having the same words but different prosody he's constructing three quite different actions. Okay, so how does he build action? How can somebody with just a limited vocabulary produce complex action? He's got a limited lexicon, but then he's making, and I'll, I'll elaborate this more, composite laminated utterances. He builds utterances by laying different parts together, like the prosody and the semantic structure. He's also able to incorporate the talk that was produced by somebody else. And uh, so, uh, and then the resources required to constitute both the local action and the speaker are distributed across multiple semiotic fields, uh, utterances, and actors. He's also got complex gesture, and he's relying upon the very active work of his interlocutors. And in this sense, instead of just being one thing, instead of just getting a category as a particular kind of action, a greeting or something, I see human action as a knot of diverse, am I in the way? Okay, as a knot of diverse intertwined resources. Thank you. Uh, okay, so human action is combined, constructed by combining unlike materials to perform simultaneous and sequential. And I want to emphasize, there's a lot of focus in conversation analysis on sequential, but there's also simultaneous organization, and I find that really crucial. So simultaneous and sequential, structure-preserving transformative operations. And by that I mean that you reuse something, you preserve the structure provided by somebody else while changing it into something new, transformative, on a local public su substrate. So separate actors participate in different ways in the construction of each other's actions. Now to demonstrate that further, I want to show you a single action constructed by people living 500 years apart. 
This is uh, from Shakespeare's As You Like It. And um, at this point, it's really crucial. What happens is one of the main things, uh, you know, in the play is that Orlando and Rosalind fall mad madly in love with each other. And this is, in fact, the exact moment when they fall in love with each other. It's the very first time they meet. Uh, however, if you read what's said there, there's no indication they're falling in love. Somebody comes up and said, Monsieur the Challenger, the princess calls for you. He says, I attend him with all respect and duty. Young, and then Rosalind, the first word she speaks, have you challenged Charles the Wrestler? And the words, no fair princess, he's the general challenger. I come as others do, but to try him uh, with the strength of my youth. Um, now, they have to, this is uh, uh, oh, oh, an excellent actor speaking this, these words. It's from a radio production of the BBC. And listen to how he speaks this line here. Monsieur the Challenger, the princess calls for you. I attend them with all respect and duty. Young man, have you challenged Charles the Wrestler? Uh, no. No. Fair princess. Uh, uh, he is the general challenger. I come but in as others do to try with him the strength. So can you see very much like Chill, the prosody creates the action. And in fact, we walked out of a production of this once because they didn't do it, uh, among other things. It was a dumb production. And if someone just reads the lines, you haven't got it. So you have, cooperatively, the words created by Shakespeare and the inflection, the acting, the prosody given by the actor. Fair princess. Well, I'll just go back and, to here for a second. Uh, okay. Have you challenged Charles the Wrestler? Uh, no. No. Fair princess. Uh, he is the general challenger. I come but in as others do okay. to try with him the strength of my youth. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to use the same sequence to explore another issue. Uh, what, I'm, what I'll say is a very important issue. Kind of the qu question is, how did language emerge in the natural world? And one of the things that we see in this sequence, I'll, I'll play it again, but you can see Chill's making these big gestures. Uh, and I, I'm sure you all picked them out, but for the moment, forget the prosody and look at the gestures. I've got to bring that up again. There, well, um, let me, oops, it's not, okay. Mm, good, Dad. No. Had enough? No, no, no. Want me to get some? No. Do you want me to take that away? No, no. Oh, you like it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so take some back with us. No, no. No, no. No, it's illegal. Yeah. No, no. All right, no, let me, no, let me no, get that. No. I thought I'd stopped it. Okay. No, no, no. okay. Okay, so he's got these gestures. And the most obvious thing, Chuck can't figure out what he's trying to say. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and what Chuck does after every one of these gestures is he provides a gloss saying what he understands. Do you want me to take that away? Something, something I'll emphasize more. What's the nature of Chuck's understanding? He's trying to figure out what Chill wants him to do. The understanding is trying to uncover the action that Chill is asking him to do rather than simply the referent. Do you want me to take that away? Okay, and here, uh, oh, take some back with us. No, no. So he's indexically, again, incorporating uh, the semantic structure produced by others. All of his no's are saying, no, it's not what you just said, chill. Okay, so there's distributed speaker sit and stuff we've already been over, that there's separate actors participating together in a common course of joint action by contributing different materials. The accumulative cooperative organ. I'll go through this fast because we've already done. But now I want to look want to look at what this, might, what, what this might do. It turns out that what Chill is asking is he wants Chuck to offer some of the grapefruit to Candy. And at this point, Candy's walking some dogs in the back of the house in the direction he's pointing. But the back of the house is also where the kitchen is, it's the direction of California and everything. And can't, Chuck, Chuck can't recover that referent and thus is unable to recover Chill's action. Okay, so Chuck, in this sense, there's a whole bunch of theories, the major theory in certain ways by people like Tomasello and Searle, and uh, that you've got a um, communicative intention. Yeah, he's recognized communicative intention. He's trying to figure out what Chill wants him to do. It doesn't take you very far. Now, Tomasello has argued that, um, well, there's, uh, as among a number of people, 
who've argued that language might have emerged from gesture, and in particular from pointing, uh, among other things, because pointing and pantomiming. Because he says, human beings find gestures such as pointing and pantomiming totally natural and transparent. Just look where I'm pointing and you'll see what I mean. Well, clearly that's false here. Chuck looks where Chill's pointing and he's unable to find out what's being pointed at or what you mean. And look at the different interpretations. He sometimes interprets the first point, which is right down to the bowl, only an inch from him. He interprets it as being about the bowl, you want me to take it away, or as a being about the grapefruit, you want to get me some more. He can't figure out, even though it's that close, he can't figure out what Chill's pointing at. And when he looks at the other, the longest point, it might be the kitchen in the back, or it could be several thousand miles away in California. So this transparency is preposterous. Um, okay, so, but the point I want to make about this is that there is a surplus of meaning in iconic and indexical signs. Whenever I point towards something, uh, both pointing and pantomiming are constructed through forms of semiosis, including iconicity and indexicality, those big words, but basically they're, they're pointed towards some sort of resemblance or contiguity or proximity. So if I'm, if to get the notion of this point, you might look at the direction I'm pointing, or if I'm enacting something like this, you'd see it as resemblance. But the issue is, there's always multiple candidates for what might be pointed at. There is too much meaning in any one of these points. And the reason is that they are relying upon inherent meaningfulness to get meaning. So from my way of thinking, the meaningfulness of action, of iconic and symbolic signs, instead of being a stepping stone to language, is an obstacle that has to be overcome. And one way of looking at this is just look at the action patterns that define Chill's action. You get, every time Chill says something, he points. I'll, I'll talk about that as saying something. You points or something. And immediately after he does this, his interlocutor provides a guess. You want me to get some. You want me to take that away. You provide a candidate gloss of what he might be indicating with his indexical or iconic sign. And then he has to either accept or reject that gloss. And if he rejects the gloss, you go back. So you've got a systematic delay in the sequence. You are unable to move immediately to the next relevant action. You've always got to take this little stepping stone and figure out what his action is before you can move forward. And I want to use this to ask the question, how did Persian symbols emerge in the natural world? Now, people in biosemiotics and others argue, and I think it's true, that a really human universal, something that no other animal has, at least in the same way, are symbols. And for Perse, symbols are defined through habit or convention, There's, or, or they're arbitrary. There's big issues as to what we mean by both arbitrary and convention but they're symbols that are recognized by members of a community and they're recognized immediately and on the spot, like the words of English or something like that. And, and in fact, it's not something I haven't said before, but something that is really thing. Everybody's always talking about, there's all these debates about what's universal in human language. I mean, there's the, the guy who did that work in the Amazon, I, I, Everett, Everett or somebody you know, like that, arguing, you know, well, they, this group doesn't have recursion. You're asking about recursion. And Levinson argued, it seems to me, and I'd be interested, any of you are linguists, that something that is universal in language, absolutely, are that language is built through types. Language is built through these formal Persian symbols, you know, these, if you want, arbitrary signs. And what I, what I wonder then is, how did symbols emerge in the natural world? Because I think that is certainly the most important event in the evolution of human cognition, and I think in, it's one of the most important events in human evolution more generally. Okay, so what we're finding here is that you can't move immediately to a next action with chills pointing. How could you do it? Well, if you had a sign that was recognized through conventional agreement rather than inherent meaningfulness, if chill had been able to say candy or give some to candy, <coughs> you would have gone immediately to that next action. Okay, what are signs that are recognized immediately through convention? They are, um, um, uh, okay, in this sense, uh, okay, I just see, word is a two-sided act. 
one of the things about whatever this is, and I know there's problems with convention, etc., but one of the things is that it has to be recognized by interlocutor. So it's a form of cooperative action. Vol Voloshinov argued that words are a two-sided act, a bridge thrown between myself and another. One end of the bridge depends on me, the other depends upon my addressee. And I think that's true for symbols in general. So m it's multi-party participation operating on each other's actions. And this is constitutive of symbols. So in this sense, all symbols are forms of cooperative action. So in this sense, uh, again, I don't know Mandarin. I can't participate in the Mandarin symbols that you may use, those of you who speak Mandarin, with each other. It requires the ability of both parties to perform appropriate op 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 operations for those symbols. And in this sense, then, symbols are intrinsically, almost by definition, a form of cooperative action. And in this sense, cooperative action sits at the center of human language. And again, there's people like Chomsky and everybody that argue, oh, the social is irrelevant to language. But if we think of this sense of how symbols are constituted, this distinctive and unique form of human sociality, which is as much cognitive as it is social, sits at the center of human language. So cooperative action then provides an environment that would systematically promote the emergence of Persian symbols, and thus language in the natural world. In other words, the issue is, how, what, what is supposed, and this I guess would be the thing, and I think this is probably a long history, I'm just speculating, clearly I have no thing, but people would begin to, again, human beings would begin to develop more and more complex forms of cooperative action, but it would be inherently slow. And at a certain point, this inherent slowness might emerge as an issue. So you might have within the system itself a push toward getting rid of that slowness. And how could you get rid of the slowness? If you move to a new kind of symbol, if you move to symbols that were recognized through convention. And the issue I'm getting with convention is less, which everybody else focuses on, representation, that you can talk about absent events, and more action. You would suddenly create a new form of human action that would have enormous consequences. It would be rapid, it could include multiple parties, and I'll, I'll try to get through in the, in the rest of the talk other things, that you're going to begin to get different cultures or something. So that what would happen is that the cooperative action would thus provide an environment that would promote the emergence of symbols and then once sustain them. I mean, once you've got this, yeah, let's keep doing it. You've got a much more powerful form of action than you would if you um, um, didn't have uh, uh, these particular things. And I forget there was something else I wanted to say about this, but I forget it. Okay, so I am, um, you know, trying to argue then that, you know, that, um, yeah, look, one of the things I'm trying to argue, and maybe this is our first place to get some of this, is that cooperative action sits at the center of what it is to be human. And by this I mean I'm also trying to get, there's a bunch of things that are looked at separately, and we'll look at this more. Language, social organization, tools, etc. Everything, it's looked at separately in separate fields. And I'm trying to argue there's something that unifies all of these into a common structure. Uh, you know, that what you're doing is that you're building all of this stuff with the same basic way of doing action. So, um, and then, uh, now what I want to uh, look at this, now I want to, uh, and this isn't true of all fields, but certainly within the fields I've looked at, we largely focus on face-to-face -face interaction. I know there's whole bunches of historical stuff, um, you know, activity theory with Yuri Angstrom and stuff, but largely when we think of language interaction, conversation analysis, we're focusing on situations of co-present. And this comes, among other things, it comes from Goffman, it comes from others, and Goffman defined the social situation. This is actually, I'm, I'm going to slightly critique it, but not much, a brilliant definition of the social situation, an environment of mutual monitoring possibilities anywhere within which an individual find himself accessible to the naked senses of all others who are present, and similarly find them accessible to him. Now, the crucial thing about this, he isn't just saying, oh, social situation, you've got two people and stuff. He's talking about the way we're in the presence of others so that we can look, understand, and build action from that. There's critiques. You could make critique about naked senses, Tara has, but I think it's a quite brilliant definition, and I think 
For example, if you were to contrast Goffman with Garfinkel, I think one of Goffman's unique contributions and something that goes beyond people like Sartre, who was one of his points of departure, etc., and I think about phenomenology in general, is, you know, you could talk about Levinas, but I think um, Goffman has it more, is his incredible focus on states of mutual presence, co-presence, and how we take into account the other. And Candy's also done a brilliant paper on mutual monitoring. Okay, now, this sense of mutual monitoring, co-presence, has constituted the domain for the study of action in human action. We talk about it as face-to-face -face interaction. However, Schutz, and you could think of Schutz's we relationship as another version of this, but Schutz went farther. He talked about predecessors. He says the actor has, in addition, empirical information about his historical predecessors. Um, he finds himself surrounded by objects which tell him plainly that they were produced by other people. So here's a mother and daughter in a kitchen, they've got frying pans, they've got stoves, they've got all this stuff that was produced by other people. Now, Schutz actually uses predecessors in intricate ways and he makes a bunch of distinctions that I'm not making. I'm talking about basically uh, how our actions are shaped by parties no longer present. Okay, and then Schutz argues he interprets them like the, the, the frying pan by arranging them within his own context of experience. So here the mother is teaching the daughter how to use the frying pan to make um, pancakes. And in this sense, we inhabit the actions and solutions of our predecessors. We got this whole question of how we're going to cook, and here in the American kitchen and things, you've got one solution. In, uh, I imagine, a traditional Chinese uh, kitchen, you have a different solution. Now, this is also and something we may get into very briefly later. Heidegger argues that being, being in the world, we're lodged in the midst of an organized complex of equipment. And the, a, a point I want to make is that we're not looking at objects in isolation. And that's the way the question of reference is usually, perform, usually asked, you know, especially in American philosophy. How do you locate what object I'm pointing to? But usually, we're looking at that entire complex of objects. And that's what Chuck was doing when he was trying to figure out what Chill was saying. However, with predecessors, there's an absence of mutual monitoring. The guy, people who built the frying pan are no longer present. They can't check out what the other people are doing with it. Now, what I tried to argue is that the essence of action in face-to-face -face is cooperative transformations, that we reuse with modification structures and architectures for perception created by earlier actors. And what I want to try to show you now is that this is true as well for the way we operate on materials left us by our predecessors. Our local, um, you know, our, our local action is constituted in part through the way we build new action by operating on and accumulatively transforming what we've inherited from earlier actors. So, for example, real simple, I'm going to look at a better example. Here is uh, Candy and a little girl may, uh, trying to make cookies with a recipe. Well, the recipe is something produced by somebody else. You transform that recipe quite literally into chocolate chip cookies. You ought to. So we, and what I mean by an architecture of, per, of perception, I first really got into this when I was on an oceanographic ship, and I realized that, for example, the bridge, all the tools they're using, the way they see the materials they're in, you're using the tools that were created by others in order to see and act in a relevant way. So we, uh, we use the, part, others partic the, particip the architectures for perception and action that we've inherited by participating in the environments that were created by our predecessors. And now I want to quickly give you a concrete example. Um, these are the um, propeller planes. They might have a little jet, but they're the propeller planes at an airport that go all over local places like California or maybe Las Vegas. It's from a, a place in Northern California that will remain anonymous. Uh, and um, what they do, they're all parked out in the runway. And basically what happens is that all the planes take off and they arrive at this airport at, say, 11 o'clock from all sorts of places. Then you've got basically an hour. And during that hour, you, may, you have to unload them. You load new passengers. Some of the passengers move from plane to plane. And you refuel the planes. You've got to make sure they're ready to take off. Well, to avoid delays, the airline got a person whose job it was to monitor whether the planes were ready for takeoff. And she wanders around, doesn't watch carefully, but yeah, she wanders around the thing looking at all the planes and trying to check if they're ready for takeoff, if there's going to be any problems, if they're going to be delayed. And the way she does this, the main thing she uses to do this is the airport schedule. 
Now, this is something you've all seen. When you go to the airline, you know, an airport, you're going to see the schedule up. And the way the schedule is written here is that each plane basically is on a single row. And the left half is an incoming flight. So it's giving you the flight number. It's giving you where it came from. It came from San Francisco. It's giving you, I guess that might be the flight number. This is the, um, the time it's expected to arrive, 12.09. And I forget what that is. It might be that usually you add the gate later uh, and stuff. And this is where it's going to, the, the flight that's going to be outgoing. It's going to leave just, a, you know, 1249, 50 minutes later or something like that, as flight 5310. And I don't know where Santoma, I don't know what, what STS is or something, social studies and science or something. Okay. Uh, okay. So what you've got is each airplane, you can track the course of each airplane on a row in the schedule. Now, what the schedule does is transform these airplanes into flights. And, and now, the schedule was created by, wasn't created by this woman sitting here alone, it was created by her predecessors, in fact, all over the airline. So she's, again, reusing materials provided by her predecessors. And she's wandering around. Uh, she sees that there's a guy standing on the wing. He's a mechanic. He's got the uh, engine of the airplane open, so she knows there's some sort of a mechanical problem. And that's something that might delay a uh, possible takeoff. So what does she do? She makes an abbreviation in the row of the schedule for that flight. She writes MX, mechanical problem, or something. So she writes this abbreviation. Now, this is, like the talk we looked at, a structure-preserving transformation on a public substrate. Uh, in fact, it's a web of structure-preserving transformations that intersect at this abbreviation. At synchronically, at a single moment in time, the airplane is transformed into a work-relevant category, a possible delay, that's saturated with a projected temporal horizon. And that's what's happening at this moment in time. But diachronically, looking at the past, the conciseness of the abbreviation is only possible because it's being placed on the row, all the numbers created by her predecessors. She doesn't have to go and say, well, the flight to San Jose might be, might be late at some point or something like that. She doesn't have to write it down as a big note. All she has to do is write this one thing because all of that other information has been provided by the people who made the schedule itself. So she's accumulatively, again, accumulatively incorporating structure provided by her predecessors who created the schedule in order to do this. In this sense, what she's doing is formally the same as what Chill's doing when he does no, no, and incorporates the talk produced by somebody else. So the thing I'm trying to say is, even though in one case you're in face-to-face -face interaction, in the other case, you're operating on materials that were created by somebody that's no longer there. The nature of the action is the same. In all these cases, you're producing accumulative transformations on what went before. Look, maybe, and I'm, it sounds grandiose, so it's a problem, and I'm going to try to grandiose. But what I'm trying to say here is maybe it's a little bit like what happened in early things. At one point, you had a theory of electricity, and you had a theory of magnetism. And what Maxwell did is show that these different things were in fact different manifestations of the same thing. And that's what I'm trying to show, that these different things, working on predecessors, tools, language structure, etc., that they're all diverse manifestations of a common form of action, of ways of building action as a human being and the distinctive ways of building action as a human being. Okay, so her... Um, the schedule, which is crucial for this, thus transforms the static objects, the airplane, into time-saturated objects. Now, there's a notion produced by a uh, very, I think it's a very important notion, the notion of the umwelt, um, that was constructed by an Estonian by the name, I believe he's Estonian, Vanushol. And he was looking at animals, and he wanted to have a scientific way of looking at the subjective experience of animals. And he pointed out that every animal exists in a particular environment and its perceptual world is structured to make relevant action possible in that environment. Now, this is a little hawk, a kestrel. And what happened, this particular kestrel, uh, the animal it hunts are these little voles. They're kind of like little mice or something. But the problem is that they live in all these rich green leaves, so they're very hard to see. 
So what's happened with the Kestrel is that there's been a transformation in the structure of its eye so that it can see the ultraviolet and it can now locate the urine trails of the voles and thus find out where they are. So there's been a biological change that has transformed the Kestrel's ability to see the world around it in the ways that are relevant for the constitution of its action. And I think that that's formally the same as what the schedule is doing, but the deal is that the schedule is emerging within culture. It's something that human beings build as a form of action. So you've switched this notion of perception and the constitution of, of a world that enables you to, like professional vision, to see action in relevant ways. You've switched it from biology and long processes of evolution into the short processes of culture. In other words, the way to build this schedule. So human communication creates cultural umwelts through cooperative action by sedimenting and reusing architectures for perception. Now, another part of that is that this th thing is done through this laminated action. You build action through these laminations. So I didn't go over this, but this is some archaeologists. The professor is pointing out to the students structure in the dirt. It's got that disturbance. So you've got their bodies coming together. Here's one looking through another, some other archaeologists looking through a Munsell chart. You have their bodies creating a public framework of mutual attention. You've got language. Then you have an environmentally coupled gesture. You have the hand moving over a meaningful field. And then you've got the objects being looked at. And what you have in this case is you've added a new field. Uh, this, I, I, didn't, I didn't elaborate this enough, but basically to classify color, archaeologists use what's called a Munsell chart. And it's this chart that was created by color scientists. And they put holes in it and they move the dirt until it fits the best culture, or the best color. But the point I'm trying to make is how, because human action is made from different parts, different actors, and moreover, different kinds of actors occupying different positions and time can contribute materials to a common action. And I think that's the center of economics, a whole bunch of other stuff, and that we already looked at. Um, okay, I didn't get that uh, enough. Okay, let's look a little bit at tools. And what I tried to say about Chill is that he builds it by laminating these different things. He laminates prosody on top of something. So the thing is built from different parts. And the same is built from human tools. You've got different parts. So you combine unlike materials to create a whole. I said that briefly earlier. But compare that with these tools of a chimp. Now, it's long been argued, it used to be think it was, um, what, Jane Goodall that found out. Everybody said man was, a, and man, you know, the old stuff, okay, human beings if you want, was the tool-making animal. Well, they found out the chimps use these sticks, among other things, to get things. But if you'll notice, that's the toolkit of a chimp. All of it is just sticks. None of the tools that are being used are made from different parts. Now, that can happen in a few cases. It's been experimentally shown, and I think things like orangs are things. But it exists in only very brief or attenuated forms in other animals. So I think there's a really unique difference between human tools and most other tools in the sense it's made from parts and thus provides all these things of accumulative transformation, different actors contributing different materials, etc. It's a stable pattern organized as a relationship. And uh, we, we already looked at this. You can create new tools by keeping the pattern the same, but modifying the elements within it. Um, OK, and where this happened, as I said earlier briefly, it happened in Africa during the Middle Stone Age, which I think is where the modern human mind emerged. I, I may think that. Maybe I'm wrong. It's up to debate. But let's just put that out as fun for now. OK, and many archaeologists, and what, what is it, the issue is hafting is the ability to combine something, to, to combine different parts. And it's been argued, many archaeologists consider the development of hafting to mark a major watershed, not just for technology, but for the human mind itself. And I think what I'm saying supports that. Um, and then this is also the locus for human economic activity. This classic anthropological thing, there was a group in New Guinea uh, that lived on the coast, and therefore they didn't have any stones. So what they did is they traded with another group that lived in the mountains. The other group gave them stones they needed for their axes. They gave them stingray spines they could use for spheres. So what you've got then is that you have trade relationships in which people in different places contribute different materials to a common form of action. 
and the iPhone demonstrates this in spades. I mean, it's built from, from the contributions of people all over the world, which creates a dense economic um, uh, web. And I would see this also as, again, a form of cooperative action. Now, one thing, what does this mean, among other things? Well, one of the things that's going on with this in all these different ways, whether language or tools, is you're secreting structure. You're putting structure into a public arena for action. Now, in the field I started from, like conversation, whatever, the structure we usually look at is talk. But it also, if we look at a state of talk, except in weird restricted things like phone calls, we find that talk is usually surrounded by the bodies of other actors. And moreover, if we look further, we find those bodies are usually in a setting. Like up here, we don't have time to go into it, but this is a kitchen. Candy's trying to teach the little girl how to read a recipe. This is an oceanographic ship. This is an archeological excavation. And the, the settings provide crucial features. So subsequent action is built through accumulative transformations of these resources. And what this does then is that, well, a first thing is that there's the combinatorial structure of human action. And I think, as I've indicated all along, this combination is, is incredible. And human beings have this omniferous capacity to incorporate whatever materials are relevant into the unfolding dialogic organization of action. But the crucial thing I want to get is that the accumulative cooperative organization of human action creates an unfolding diversity of varied inhabited settings, cultures, and languages. In other words, one of the being each finely tuned to the activities of the communities that inhabit them. So one of the really big things about human beings, in addition to language and all this other stuff we've looked at, is that human beings have diverse languages and diverse cultures. So how did that come about? And my own sense is you start somewhere. And as you accumulate by reusing earlier resources, you progressively differentiate. There's a whole bunch of separate path-dependent chains of accumulation that will eventually lead you know, to things like different languages, I don't understand Mandarin, different cultures, different fields, different societies. So this very same process leads to an accumulation of diversity in both language, settings, cultures, forms of understanding, etc. And as a cooperative process, unfolding actions weaves together the diverse semiotic materials that form the dense inhabited environments that simultaneously contextualize that action. Okay, uh, the last extended thing, I'm not going to get into this, the last one I want to look at is um, another consequence of this. Once we've got all these different languages and cultures, you've got to build new competent inhabitants. Uh, you've got to build people who can understand Mandarin, people can understand English, you've got to build, uh, you know, people who are not fly airplanes. I don't. Uh, you've got to build in academic fields. You've got a weird group of people that know what adjacency pair means or what accumulative action means. And that's not something that... It, so in all these fields, the issue is that you're going to have to build competent inhabitants, people who understand the world in just the ways that are make it possible to accomplish the activities of a particular community, like speakers of a language, speakers of a particular scientific community, etc. And what I want to argue, what this has been argued, has been argued, and I think this is true, that pedagogy is as unique and universal for human beings as language. The only thing I would object to slightly is I don't think it's just pedagogy in the sense of all of us sitting here in a classroom or something. I think that it's built into the organization of action itself. And what I'm trying to argue is that an pedagogy is another one of the systematic consequences of the cooperative organization of action. You're going to accumulate. The accumulation is going to lead rather quickly to great diversity so that every community faces the task of constructing new inhabitants. Why we got a university here to build new chemists, conversation analysts, uh, you know, people in Asian languages, etc. Every community is facing that particular task. And the way I would differ from pedagogy is that it can use, but doesn't require, a separate me mechanism. But it can be found within the endogenous organization of cooperative action itself. So I'm maybe slight repeat, but I want to make the point. Every community is faced with the ongoing task of building skilled, knowing actors. But simultaneously, the distinctive ob objects 
that populate its environment. Maps for archaeologists and geologists, uh, you know, uh, whatever. Structure in the water for oceanographers. Uh, adjacency pairs and third pair repair initiators for conversation analysts, etc. You're simultaneously building these phenomenal objects and actors capable of recognizing and working with those objects and that that's the task that everyone performs. Now I want to look at how this is done in local action. I will play this. I, I can if you want. No, I can't. So you won't. Okay. This is in the midst of surgery. This is very high level education. You, you've already got the person learning here is a skilled surgeon. But what's, and, but what's happening here is the thing that defines surgery, and I would define identity as practice. So what defines surgery is the ability to skillfully cut living human flesh and to cut it in the way that will help rather than harm the patient. And all that's happening in this little sequence is that this tool up here is kind of like a, a, a scalpel, a cautery, but it's a scalpel that can be heated like a soldering iron. And the reason you do that is that if you heat a blood vessel but by having a hot tool, you're going to melt the ends of the blood vessel and you're going to seal it so you don't, have, you don't have a whole bunch of bleeding. So you've got this knife here. And then what you do is you hold up with a little pair of tweezers, it's called mosquito. You hold up the flesh to be cut and then you cut it. Okay, so a real simple, really, really simple action. Even those of us who aren't surgeons can understand it. But it turns out that action is being performed by two actors in different positions. The person doing the cutting is the new surgeon, and that's what we may think is going on. But the person who's lifted up the correct piece of flesh is the older skilled surgeon. He's the one that's located the place that has to be cut. So you're learning how to cut, but more crucially, how to see relevant structure, to navigate inside the human body by working cooperatively with another skilled practitioner. And I think that's the essence of human education in the traditional way. Now, one of the most basic things, I just kind of like this little movie, I'll play it. One of the most basic things posed for human beings and human communities, what is it? So let's look at this. This is archaeologists and geologists. What kind of thing is that? And uh, let me just play this. Oh, I want to make it louder. Just a sec. Oh, it's loud. That's okay. Okay, let's go. What's the mineralogy here? So what are you guys seeing? What, what is this thing? Here? So what, what would this be? Okay, one of the most basic questions of human beings. What is it? Okay, so again, I'm going to repeat, but I want to look a little more detail. So every community is facing with the task of constructing the answer to that question. What is it? Or within the community, the distinctive objects that make up the phenomenal environment being scrutinized. So here we're looking at geologists and what they've got, the objects they've got are both categories, they rock categories like quartz or muscovite or clay, and they also build maps and diagrams. And I'll note that Mick, who's sitting here, is doing quite brilliant work analyzing uh, these processes for his PhD dissertation. So you've got the categories are, again, Persian symbols, types, formal abstract categories that have to be recognized through agreement and the types themselves are not sensory objects that you know it's like it's like the phoneme ta ta as an abstract phoneme doesn't exist in the world it's a, a distinction that we recognize and the maps are not iconic diagrams but models of relevant processes so what you're trying to show on maps are things like faults and things like that rather than just a photo and at the same time you've got to build, in addition to building the objects that are the source of your science or whatever, you've also got to build actors. And to do that, you're going to have to build human bodies that can transform the objects, the, their sensory experience of the objects they encounter into the relevant categories. We'll look at it with geologists. You might be able to say it. You've got conversation analysts who can listen to a big of talk and transform that listening again into adjacency pairs or something else. But I think it's more clear here with the geologists in uh, types. So you've got to build actors, or what I will say is inhabitants, because these actors are all lodged within specific communities that are capable of recognizing abstract types through sensory encounters, through their embodied experience of the qualities found within complex objects that they're working with. And in this sense, Another crucial thing is that both objects and actors emerge and are shaped to be what they are through time. 
if you look at all of the stuff in psychology, et cetera, Tomasello, et cetera, you're always going to find things without taking time seriously into account. Do people have mental states? Is there a theory of mind? This, that, and the other. Can you recognize? And at least in this thing, the whole perspective is the unfolding through organization through time, which makes it possible to incrementally operate on the contributions of others. So we'll look at this sequence. And what's happening here is these are student geologists. They're really doing work in Yellowstone. And uh, one of the things, they're, they're redrawing a map. They're trying to test out the accuracy of an earlier map and transforming it. And one of the things they've been looking for and alerted to look for is muscovite, because muscovite will be a diagnostic category that will indicate relevant things. So red over here treats this as a possible instance of muscovite. And let me just say, it isn't the whole rock she's holding is muscovite. Muscovite is a little kind of thing in the midst of that rock. But note she does it as a tentative. She first doesn't just look at the rock. She looks at it as a geological object. She uses a term like muscovite. So she constitutes it what it is for them. And then another person comes in and joins her. White, uh, I'm just talking about the color of their, their, their shirts. White comes in and um, points toward it and says, yeah, I don't know what that is. She's also holding that as only a possibility, a candidate possibility. If you want a liminal object, it hasn't yet been constituted as that category. Then they take it to the professor, the senior geologist. He says, I think there is. And then he says, yeah. And at this point, it has at last been constituted as that kind of an object. Let's take a look at the video. Uh, let me, I may have um, jumped, I jumped too far forward in this. Let me just bring it up again. Okay, so we're seeing that that whole thing of trying to come up with the category is being organized both in the field and socially with others. Now, as you just heard, the senior guy, Daryl, whatever, he says Muscovite was one of those things we're looking for. How is that understood? Uh, again, going back to conversation analysis, other things, you understand in terms of a relevant next action. So the woman who initially found it says, so we should take a station here. So she's finding out the relevance of that category for their local course of action. Now, once you've got this, you might figure, okay, you know what it is. It's been said it's Muscovite. That's all there is to it. But the most crucial thing here is that the students keep looking at that rock. So we should take a station here. Yeah. So she grabs the rock, White does, looks at it intensely. Is it that? Then asks again, is it that? She's no longer asking, is it muscovite? But she's asking, what in the rock is actually the instance of muscovite? Yeah, stuff that's really silvery. And he says, yeah. He, the senior points it out. Yes, yeah, stuff that's really silvery there. So what she's trying to find out are the sensory uh, characteristics of the rock. What she should look at is sensory fe features, silvery, etc., in order to be able to transform her sensory experience into the abstract type of muscovite. And um, I won't go into it more, but notice that he isn't saying it is silver. He's using a term like silvery stuff or, or something. So he's uh, pointing that's toward it. That's that's then someone else comes and gets it. Ask again. Sweet. And you begin to hand around the rock. So the thing I think is really important is that even when they've been told what it is, the students are working with the actual materials in order to gain the skills for their bodies, to sediment into the sensory experience of their bodies the ability to recognize this type. And in this sense then, you're building the sensorium, the perceptual body of a geologist, as a public structure through cooperative action. And here's the more general question that I would come up with, going back to how did symbols emerge in the world. How do, what, what Peirce argues basically, and you could see this with the difference between, you know, um, 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 particular sounds in language and the phone phonemic, if you want, I don't know if the term's still used, but basically, how do, you, how do you understand the difference between a T and P? How do you transform the sounds you actually hear into relevant sounds within the language? And you could think of those as types. And what Peirce argued, he also said there were legisigns, and that legisigns are always recognized through replicas, examples of a particular type. 
So we hear different versions of Tom, Be um, Ted, or something like that. We hear different versions, and we transform them so all those things are elements of whatever the phonetic distinction of, let's just say, T. Okay, so how is it done? Well, what you've got is perceivable phenomena are treated as installations of a type. And these phenomena are constellations of qualities, such as silvery color. And what you've got to do, what you're doing through this work in the field, is you're in training bodies to be able to recognize those diverse constellations of qualities as instances of types. So you're regimenting through public practice the embodied experience of newcomers. Just real quick, it's not too important, but a lot of people talk about replicas as the regimentation of replicas into a type. And then there you're looking, and this is common like in French philosophy, you're looking almost entirely in the world of signs. And what I'm thinking, what I want to argue is, prior to the world of signs are the world of bodies able to use those signs. So those signs can only be uh, sustained through action. So you've got to build the capacities of actors able to work with those signs and you can't focus on signs in isolation from the courses of action that sustain and constitute them. So you regiment experience so that the qualitative sensations of objects can be recognized as replicas of a particular action-relevant type, a consequential phenomenal object. And in this way, we're creating a populated phenomenal world uh, that's not lodged within the psychology of the individual but instead within a world of perception that's shared imperfectly with other inhabitants. And um, so, uh, well, that's, okay, probably uh, enough for this. Uh, uh, so, well, maybe to conclude on uh, this part, and there's only one other little thing. In the very first sentence of Studies in Ethnomethodology, Garfinkel argued every reference to the real world, even when references to physical or biological events, is a reference to the organized activities of everyday life. And here I think we've seen this. We've had a bunch of scientists looking at the world, looking at Muscovite. But the only way you can constitute that are through these more basic endogenous practices of human interaction through which you're constructing knowledge. Now, Garfinkel made a second statement at the very first line of his dissertation. And he was talking about uh, Parsons, but of how you'd build a social structure. And he said the other development, not yet adequately exploited, is seeks a generalized social system built solely from the analysis of experience structures. So what I've been trying to do in this last little part is look at how experience is transformed into public knowledge and arguing that the way that's done is through the in situ activities of a community. Okay, only one other thing I'd like to say, and that is people very frequently think that what I'm talking about is cooperation, and which is kind of what other people talk about. But I'm not, and I want to indicate it's closely related, and I think it might be a more general thing than cooperation. But the definition of cooperation in, say, biological anthropology is something like a process of groups or organisms working or acting together for their common mutual benefit, as opposed to working in competition for selfish benefit. So, you know, you cooperate or you fight other people, and that's a big difference. Notice that this is a teleological definition. You're defining cooperation in terms of its purpose, its outcome. You're doing it to help other people. And the analytic focus in practice, I don't think it has to follow from this definition, but the analytic focus has largely gone to the psychological infrastructure that would make shared action possible. So you could look at Tomasello and Searle, and you get notions like collective intentionality, recognition of communicative intentions, etc. And what you're trying to do is specify specific timeless psychological attributes. So you argue human beings have theory of mind, human beings recognize communicative intentions, other animals don't. Well, we do some experiments. Some other animals can in weird circumstances. But you're basically trying to define these abstract mental states as characteristic, and they're kind of timeless states, like the ability theory of mind or something like that. Now, there is something that's very important in cooperation that my sense doesn't quite get, which is altruism. And there is a big issue as to how animals could put themselves in danger to help others, and that's a very important topic. Okay, so what I'm looking at here are cooperations, and I'm not talking about trying to help somebody else. I'm talking about performing accumulative transformations on materials provided by a predecessor. 
You can use this when you're arguing, when you're fighting with somebody. And instead of trying to look in the first place at the psychological infrastructure, I want to look at the diverse public practices that are used to constitute action. I think that you might get a psychological infrastructure from that. It might grow out of it. But I don't think that the first place to look is the psychology of individuals, but instead public practice. Mutual benefit is not required. A soccer goalie, his ability to uh, stop a goal requires the actions of the person who's being goal is being stopped. That isn't for the benefit of the guy who's not making a goal. Even warfare. It also uh, doesn't, uh, this thing, unlike the other, is built on continental philosophy such as Heidegger and Schutz. And to look at that real quick again, Chuck's unable, go back, to figure out what Chill's pointing at. Now what Tomasello argues, here's the way you go to identify a referent. You first attempt to identify my referent, I'm from there, attempt to uh, infer my underlying social attention. So I first look at, um, at the speaker, you first identify the speaker, then you try to get the intention. What did Chuck do? Absolutely different. He tried to find the candidate action. He find, was trying to find whether Chill wanted him to remove the dirty dishes, to get more stuff. So you find the action and then you locate the referent within the gestalt that's constructed by the action. Uh, and then the reference can shift dramatically when you find different courses of action. So you've got these action relevant complexes in the life world. Okay, and you have removed time by and large, though certainly Boyd and Richardson would get time on a, on a, a large biological, but if you look at people like Tomasello and Searle, you've moved local unfolding time from your analysis by getting these kindness of timeless psychological states. And what we're focusing on here is how intersecting consciousnesses inhabit unfolding time together as processes are progressively revealed. And that accumulation is intrinsic to cooperative action. Now, the very last thing is here's an experiment that I think really gets the difference. It's a good experiment. And it's some people, Franz de Waal and some of his colleagues, I'm sorry I haven't got... I, I'm, I'm just, I, the main author, first author was a researcher in Thailand and I, I don't know how to pronounce his or her name and I, I regret that. I, I have a great deal of respect for all the work this, this researcher did. And what uh, he's trying to, and so the wall is trying to say, hey, you're wrong guys, you've got cooperation in other animals. And this builds from a whole bunch of earlier uh, experiments with apes. So basically the nature of the experiment is you've got some food on this plate, but it's very, very, this big pallet over here, but it's really heavy and one elephant can't pull it toward him or her by herself. What you need is two elephants pulling in unison to each other. And you find out you get two ropes, the elephants even wait for the other one to come, and you say, yes, we've demonstrated cooperation because two people, two elephants, have to work together to get this done. So, it is, they are doing, in one sense, cooperative action because they're literally inhabiting in fine detail the world, the architecture for perception and action, created by the predecessors. But, are they co-op, they're not building cooperative action with each other. And most simply, what they're doing is they're performing the same action in unison for mutual benefit. But there's no decomposition and reuse of what the other elephant has done. They both pull the rope. One of them doesn't go look at the pulling of rope and transform that into something new and set off this historical change of accumulation. So you haven't got cooperative action by transforming and reusing materials created by another. And that I would see as the major difference. So what I've tried to argue is the importance of cooperative action. This leads to accumulation. It, it provides an environment in which language might have emerged and then be sustained, specifically an environment that would promote the emergence of symbols or signs recognized through cooperative action. You have, in addition, cooperative action with predecessors. Its same processes go on with tools. You also get an accumulation of diverse languages, settings, etc. And you have this task of building skilled knowing inhabitants. So I'm trying to argue that these processes of cooperative action might sit at the center of the human adaptation and cut across things that are typically looked at in isolation, 
like language, social organization, tools, learning, that are all seen as like separate little islands unconnected to each other. And I'm trying to propose that they're all different manifestations of the same process, the way that human beings build action. Okay, that's my talk. Um, okay. I know it went a little long, but I wanted to get the whole talk out at this point. So, yeah. 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 Questions? Yeah, Chuck, this is again, this is just groundbreaking. This is like what it, what it means to be human, human being, and human society. And the many, many manifestations that you just show us just make great, great sense to me. Right. And from a linguistic point of view, um, I'm very glad to tell you that um, uh, I just. Uh, uh, the course paper that I've I just wonder, Mick, it's up to you, but do you want to try to get people or forget it? Oh, oh, oh it's I don't know if you can. It might be. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Daisy's in the shot? She, no. no, okay. I think I don't, I'll just have to back it up some. Okay. okay. Yeah, well. Okay, if you have to go, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Okay, uh, Daisy, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm from a linguistic point of view. I study linguistics and linguistics. Uh, uh, I think this is central to what language is and what mm -hmm. grammar is. And, right. and actually, uh, I just, uh, the paper that I, uh, I did under your supervision, right. uh, just recently published this month. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's, great. It's great. an application and of uh, your theory in linguistics. Uh -huh. So, um, building on this theory, I was trying to uh, use corpus linguistic methodologies to to do two things. First uh. of all, quantitatively, yep. like how common it is right. in language for uh, speakers to reduce uh, a prior speaker, right. including he, him or herself, words, and to modify it, transform it, and uh. to feel something new. And uh, I found that more than as high as a more than eighty percent of the time, uh -huh. this happens in language. Great, yeah, right? And, uh -huh. uh, and then the other thing. Uh, oh, I also did the gesture. Too. Yeah. It's, uh -huh. I, I found one third of the time. Oh, yeah. that's great. And so that's one thing quantitatively. So this is uh, just encompassing. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. like fundamental. It's okay. quantitatively, like uh, compelling evidence. Great, 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 great. Supports this great uh -huh. central theory of human yeah. action. The linguistic, uh, uh -huh. from the linguistic perspective. Uh -huh. The other thing is that I want to uh, look at quant uh, longitic, uh, longi yeah. uh, like trace the time. And so I, the the paper, the, fir the study was uh, first um, conducted three or four, well actually five years uh -huh. ago when I first studied uh -huh. with you. Oh. And then I traced a, um, a phrase, uh, so Bill Gates says uh, I'm not, uh, I'm more of a a technology think type yeah. thinker, and he's more of a business type thinker. So I traced the development of that phrase, uh, a type X, X type thinker, uh -huh. over five years, oh. using like billions of several wow, that's great. corporate billions of uh, data, of words of data, and I, I found that uh, first of all, Bill Gates is probably the among the first to create that that right. word, and then. Over time, it, it, it got uh, reused by other people, especially uh -huh. by um, like, um, some, some other celebrities, like, like um, five ministers. Uh -huh. And then over these five years, it has increased. Uh, like, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but okay. four or five times. Great. So that's probably the early documentation of how a, lang a new syntactic structure or formulaic expression is created oh, that's by great. reusing the, like the very first creator uh -huh. by reusing it and then transform form forming maybe because yeah. I found that over time there are many things that go can go into this yeah. category an X type thinker. Yeah. So a new like a new syntactic structure or if it's not creative then a new a new formulaic like right. expression is, has been okay. is being created. That's, that's so, great. So yeah, so from the linguistic uh, evidence has uh, provided uh, quantitative uh, evidence, that's supporting evidence for this right, great, right, great right. theory. Right, that's no, that's great. Thank amazing. you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Right, thank you. And I guess something else that's relevant is also this work on intextualization in linguistic anthropology, too. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there, th there are other questions or comments of any type. Um, yes. I just that, wanted to ask about, like, um, how do you, you probably didn't have time to mention it a lot, but I was wondering how do you actually wanted to define pedagogy? Well, that's the thing. I'm picking up, the way I'm using it is I'm reusing the literature from Sisbin Gurgley. And Sisbin Gurgley seems to define it as explicit instruction. But there's a lot of important work arguing uh, that there are societies where there isn't any or very little explicit instruction. And people are looking at it. Some of you may remember who's been a wonderful visit here, Lourdes de Leon, who's done work in Chiapas. And in, that is one of the societies where it's argued children are never explicitly instructed in the sense that they participate in the activities around them. And I want to try to account for how that is done, which is why I'm trying to have, in part, this more general sense of um, becoming a competent inhabitant through transformations. And at the Click Conference about two years ago, Lourdes gave a wonderful paper about how a kid in her community and this was all done in isolation, was learning that there's a thing that you can see in the earliest pictures of Mexican life at the time of, um, of the conquest of, of Native Americans. They would carry things with what's called a trunk line or something. They have this thing around their head that they use. You could watch the kid beginning to inhabit that structure that had come from his predecessor. So that's why, um, here's, a, here's another maybe thing of mine. I don't know how far it goes. I'm wanting to at least render as problematic, it may be, a whole host of completely separate islands of specializations, like pedagogy, like language, like tools. And I agree, there, there can well be different things that develop. But I'm trying to argue uh, that instead of saying, well, we need a special mechanism for learning, that there's a common thing that could provide the basic framework, and then we may begin to get some of these differences within it. Because I think. Basically, the way a world the thing looks is I think of it as separate islands. Somebody will look at tools, someone will look at cooperation, someone will look at language, etc. But they're all dealt with as kind of self-contained wholes. And in fact, the whole question of language evolution is posing language as though it's its own absolutely coherent domain. And um, maybe I'll just bring this up. I'm not sure, because it's a quote I found recently. I like and these were people who were rather strongly attacking Chomsky. But if you think of the notion of how language is acquired and the whole arguments about the poverty of stimulus, one of the things they said is, well, the only way you observe language, you can create or learn language is by observing the language of others. I think the whole notion of observing is crazy. It's um, a, a, a very uh, Cartesian. We're not in a room with a one-way mirror observing something. We're participating in the midst of action. And the reason that we have to master language as, say, children or babies is in order to carry out the courses of action that we're embedded within. So again, from a Heideggerian perspective, we're structured, we're thrust into a world that's already structured through meaning. And in order to be able to participate in that world, we're going to have to master the practices that are using to constitute it. And some of those practices are language. And we've also got, as we look at the decomposition, it's not that you've just got full-fledged sentences that you have to decipher as though you're a computer program. You've got people constantly decomposing those sentences into their elements and reusing them. And you're finding out the possibilities for reuse and probably also been sanctioned when you, when you go beyond those possibilities. So I, I would, would see all that happening there as pedagogy. It, not, but it's the process, and that's why I want to say you've got to become a competent inhabitant of, of the world that you're living in. And, that's, and you, of course, live in many worlds. So being a speaker of English as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Could you provide a definition of laminated action? Yes, I'm, I'm using it again somewhat loosely to get to this, and it may not work in all cases. The term initially came from Irving Goffman when we were in his class. And in his deconstruction of the speaker, and I have examples of that, but I don't know where they are now. You know, he, but what, what he was always talking about uh, in that class is he was looking at quotatives. And if you think of quotation or complementizers, he was always arguing that you've got a different layer. If I say something like, Candy said she has to stay late at school today, 
you've got the, if you want, the utterance, the proposition, she has to stay late at school today. Then you have another layer, candy said. So you've got a, uh, a layering uh, in that. You're, you're laminating action, and, and you can laminate multiple actions. Uh, you know, candy, um, 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 I don't know, Mick said, Candy said she was going to be late today or something like that. You can get those multiple things. And they're looked at as complementizers. But I was very struck by the notion of lamination. You're bringing things together in this way. And then what I got, which is not where Goffman went, he w is how you um, bring different kinds of materials together to build an action. So, I mean, just visually, and it could be a wrong way to think about it intrinsically, but visually, I think you've got the words, then you laminate the prosody on top of it, and you can laminate a month's cell chart in the midst of that. There's many ways it could fall down, because it's a time-bound process. But also, I think, probably the better way to look at spoken language is that you've initially got the prosodic contour, and you carve out linguistic units, segmental units, in the midst of that contour. I mean, I think we've got it backwards if we talk about super segmental. I think that we basically initially got the whole prosodic envelope, and then we divide that into relevant segments. But, um, and the, the, these are different kinds of phenomena. Even though they're both occurring simultaneously in a single medium, the stream of speech, they're different things. The things you're doing with prosody are different than the things you're doing with segmental structure, like no, no, no. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I got this quarry from somebody who's doing research on they wanted to define medium, and they had a bunch of definitions, none of which I want. But I'm thinking that a medium is a particular material field or structure that makes particular forms of semiosis possible. So if you think of it this way, the stream of speech is something that would make possible different forms of semiosis. And we didn't look at it today, but hopscotch is something that can make uh, relevant different forms. You can jump up and down a hopscotch tree. But anyway, so OK, yeah. Are, are there some more questions? I have a minor um, comment uh, about regarding um, your uh, statement or your great uh, finding that um, uh, building both actors, knowledge, the skilled actors and objects, I would like to suggest uh, maybe knowledge as well. Yes. Right? It's all yeah. part and parcel right. of the same package. Yeah. And it goes back, you could go back to philosophy, there's a subject object distinction that people like. Um, Heidegger was really trying to destroy and maybe cursed it in a different way. But the whole thing, I think, in general, is that we divide things up and then treat the things we've divided up as self-sufficient wholes. I mean, language is a classic example. There is something, and I think that you are getting this distinctive form of semiosis. But then the thing comes to treat language as though it's a completely autonomous domain. Then you look for the evolution of language. You argue that language is separate from social organization. And I see really what you've got in all cases are these semiotic ecologies. And that the way you build action and meaning is by bringing together these different resources. And language creates a whole host of new resources. I really think that linguistic structure, syntax, that's all amazing and crucial. But it doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, I mean, Peirce argued that all types are only can work because they're embedded within a larger s infrastructure of iconic and indexical signs. And I think that's true for language. So I think we want to look at this ecology. But the deal is, like, let's take the way Chomsky defined language as grammatical sentences and um, said that things like performance errors were irrelevant uh, to their organization. You've kind of created an idealization in which language exists in its own separate world. And what, something I didn't go on, some of you may have read, I've argued that like things like restarts are on the one hand ways of getting a hearer's attention and that they also, like I've been arguing today in a different way, display language structure. So he posed the question, mm -hmm. how could a person who didn't know language recognize relevant structure? At the same time he said, well, all these restarts, all these repairs are irrelevant to that problem. But the solution would probably be found in that very problem. So I'm I would like to push against, in general, the sense of well-defined fields. I think that the division, say, between who Durkheim and uh, Saussure, of one saying, hey, I've got language, that's my field. Hey, I've got sociology. That's a complete defined thing. 
that the way that you set up those two fields is already a mistake that is a, making it impossible to see the way that each of those informs the other. Look, quite clearly, I like linguistics. No, I do. I think it's crucial. It's one of the greatest lessons. But linguistics is far too important. Language is far too important to li leave to linguists. Uh, ling language is a basic form of human social organization. It's the way that we build action in concert with others. And yet, the form of establishing fields has been to create a domain that's distinctly your own. Language, sociology, talk and interaction, whatever the domain may be, psychology. And, and there's ways sciences work, but I think that you, uh, well look, conversation analysis is a good example. You can't really find the intrinsic organization of either language or social organization if you act as a sociologist saying, oh, I don't have to deal with language, too complicated, I'll let the other guys deal with that. Or if you act as a linguist and say, ah, social stuff, completely irrelevant to this abstract concept. You're never going to get the answer. I think Harvey Sachs and, and get, get, they really demonstrated that the whole way you get it is in the intersection. So conversation analysis is looking at language structure as a form of social organization. And that's right. Doesn't deny the reality of language structure, but it gets you a better handle on looking at its organization and how it works. Yeah, I remember reading your one of your articles on this, right? I think yeah. when a scientific domain actually mm. it's not maybe right. not a good thing for the development of scientific inquiry. Yeah. Yeah. And but, also the, yeah. the 2006 paper on uh, how stars can provide uh, meaningful resources yeah. for them to learn again. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to end in a moment, but if there are any other questions, I, I'd love to have them. If there's any other points of discussion or any objections to the argument. Yeah, um, there's two. Okay, great. So this might be greater than what we have time for here, but um, I was just sort of wondering about the role of agency mm -hmm. here. I, I think you've talked before about, um, with regard to chill in particular, the mm -hmm. The building of agency and um, and I was wondering if maybe you could say a little bit more about that, especially in terms of the the cooperative action, the 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 way that the the way that you talk about performing the operations on the prior substrate. Right. Um, is it is it fair to look at that as a form of agency yeah. on the part of the the uh, say? chopper or whoever the, the mm -hmm. second interlocutor right. is, or is it is it something that it should be seen more as emerging through the structure? Well, I'm not this, sure. This is stuff I haven't read the lit on agency uh, recently, but basically when I did read it, and it, there's a whole bunch of interesting issues, there's, and, and this is oversimplified because agency obviously comes, I mean, it's the whole thing of the world economy and everything, but one way of thinking is, um, where do you get the power to do something? And there's a sense within some fields of looking at agency as something that's lodged within individuals and things like that. Then there's another sense in which you could say agency is social, that you have all the oil companies in the world and they really do terrible things to all the things. And there's a way in which, and you're setting up a dichotomy between individual and social agency. Well, I think that what's going on with Chill is that Chill is a strong agent. He objects to what Candy says, he does. But his agency is impossible for him to do as an individual. It only emerges from that larger social matrix. So in this sense, I don't see a contradiction between individual and social agency. You gain your power as an individual through the way in which you're embedded within a social matrix. Um, I'll give a very simple example from someone who used to participate in the seminars just a couple years ago, Pauline uh, Beaupois, who just did a dissertation on negation. Well, I mean, again, there's people like Searle that look at negation as an individual action. But in fact, let's just take the simplest case of protest. A mother tries to get the child to do something, you know, and pushes away. Well, it's negating, but that kind of pushing is only possible because of the prior actions of the mother, the way that the kid is trying to do it. So I think, and in this sense then, that's why I was trying to argue a little bit in there, I think we want to get rid of looking at the individual, whether it's the individual actor or the individual utterance, as your primary locus. There's ways in which chill emerges as an individual, but you don't want the package that makes that possible to be restricted 
to him as an individual or to the utterances he say. So in this sense, we're getting a sense of agency being historically embedded within these developing processes is only possible because of our inhabiting this social world. And, and that's the way I'd like to look at it. But we still get strong individuals, individual experience, individual knowledge, but that's been shaped by our participation in a, a world that's been created by others in many ways. Um, okay, you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, tools uh, use different uh, parasitic contours. Yes. No, no, no. Um, I'm wondering, what, because he lost the speaking ability, Right. do you have other evidences to prove normal uh, people, I mean, people who have the normal speaking ability also use this kind of uh, prosodic contour of yes. the oh, same yeah. length with the unit? Yes, all the time. I mean, a lot of people, Betty Cooper Coolin, for example, has mm -hmm. done a lot of work on this. And I think it, 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 you know, it's very clear. I can't think of examples now. But it's certainly the case that we can use the same thing. Well, look, I mean, the, the obvious ones, like, OK. Like you can say, well, you want to go out to dinner? OK. Oh, OK. Or something. You know, there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can inflect the same words with very different meaning by, using, by putting different parts of the order. So again, I think this is a general thing. As I tried to say, we voraciously accumulate all the different resources we could do, you find, to build the local relevant action of the moment. And I think that's, that's good. So it's again, and it's, it's trying to focus on our combinatorial ability, but not just syntactic combination of units, but pulling together everything that might help us build a particular kind of action. Okay, so I think we're just about, but is there any last questions? Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I just want to follow up on Claire's yes. question. So yes. Also, including the, the time when Chill was appreciating the picture, and then yes. he said the deity or something, and then yes. he said it's a positive evaluation yes. for that picture. Um, that kind of intonation is also picked up by like how people use intonation right. in a positive way. That right, true? that's right, that's right. And it's also the case, I mean, this is a, you, you phrased it, and it's true, kind of. Mm -hmm. The Chill lost the ability to speak. Well, he lost the ability to productively produce the segmental structure of language, basically. But he didn't lose the ability to speak. He still had all this rich prosody. And it's kind of amazing how much he can do with the prosody. And I think the same is true with very, very young children. And you may find, I think, just about everybody in this room has had the experience of going into uh, a community or culture where we didn't yet know the language and how much we rely upon prosody in our ability to communicate under the, and our ability also, which even Wittgenstein pointed out with a quote from Augustine, we can kind of make guesses as to what other people mean by their actions and the prosody they're using, even when we don't yet know the language. We fail in all these fine details, but it, it's always there in that sense. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.